starting to fill up. Good to see you guys. This live stream will be for the geeks out there. Thank you very much, Eric. Bad news, Camille. Welcome, Camille. Um, you're muted, by the way, but hi. Uh, Camille is uh, at an undisclosed location in Europe. We can't we can't tell you guys where he's where he's at uh, for security reasons. But he's uh, I know of Camille from uh, him commenting on a lot of my videos, and he's um, very well read and uh, makes very intelligent, astute comments. And so I asked him to join me today because Cam Spires can't make it. He really wanted to be here, and uh, he would have been here, but um, today he, uh, there was a, a woman pregnant, and she had a pullover at the side of the road. And, um, and so he helped deliver uh, twin boys, and he says he asked the lady if it was okay if, um, you know, since he's missing this live stream, if it's okay if he would call the, if she would call the two boys, uh, Doug and Camille, and she agreed. So there you go, Camille. Awesome. It's <laughs> great to hear. Cool story. Uh, <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, so we want to critique uh, in an informal way what I posted a few days ago, uh, Michael Lacona, who's a New Testament historian, versus um, Crossan, who is a historian as well, but those two Christian historians are very different, and uh, you'll hear just how different they are. But before we go on to that, uh, Camille and I were talking and saying, you know, it's, it's amazing to us how many hours these Christian historians will spend talking about all the minutia of this stuff when really this has little bearing on why they believe. And I know Christians hate that when I say that, but I really do think it's true. And I want to play a clip, not from that debate, but to just illustrate what is really going on here. So hopefully everybody can hear this. I, I, I do believe that truth is something we should seek with sincerity and that we have nothing to fear with it. What we have to fear is that our biases will be so strong that they will blind us from seeking and discovering truth and it may cost us eternity that i think right there summarizes why christian new testament historians believe what they believe they're thinking about eternity that's my greatest fear his greatest uh, fear kim her mom here uh, is a clip from a debate with matt delahunty i'm sure a lot of you have seen it Again, this is, I think, the real reason why um, uh, people like Michael Lacona believe what they believe. Um, her sister and several of her family members have dabbled in occultic practices over the years. She's told me about some of the things that she has seen, kind of stuff that makes the hair on the back of your neck would stand up. They were playing with a Ouija board in her kitchen, and uh, they're in high school at the time. And so they're playing the Ouija board, and there's this... Uh, metal trash can with a metal lid in the kitchen. I said, Kim, a metal trash can and lid in your kitchen? She said, well, we lived out in the country, you know? So, yeah, so as they're playing the Ouija board, all of a sudden, uh, they saw the lid, the metal lid on the can, just lift up and hover over the can for a moment, and then it launched itself against the wall, hits the wall, goes flat against the wall, and it's as though someone was holding it against the wall, and then it just slid down real slowly down the wall, and then when it hit the ground, it started to spin like a, like a coin. And of course, they're just falling over each other, trying to get out of the room, to run out of that room. So there's stuff like this that's strongly... Now this, Camille, this sounds like a, a scene out of Poltergeist, and it's like, Michael Lacona, do you really believe this happened? Really? 
Yeah, I would also ask him, like, does is the evidence for this better than the evidence for the resurrection? Like, can did he actually go and interview the EI witnesses and stuff like that? Or is he relying on, like, anonymous uh, <laughs> hearsay? Well, I, I had to keep this all these clips short. Um, and so, you know, Christians always assume I'm taken out of context. Yes, by definition, uh, every clip I take is out of context. But, um, but he did email... Uh, these people and they say, yeah, they still say it happened. But this was like when they were in high school, I don't know how many years, like probably a decade or more years ago. But the main point that you bring up is a great one with uh, an amazing claim like this. I, I avoid using the word extraordinary because that's a trigger word for a lot of theists. <laughs> um, uh, for amazing claims like this, at least we can go look these people in the eye and ask them and even hook them up to a lie detector test and all these things. Um, so, but anyhow, let's keep going. We suggest that there is a supernatural uh, dimension in reality. And of course, there are tons of stories like this. I could give you some of my own that I've experienced. I can give you some of my own that I've experienced. So uh, I truly think that uh, the reason why a lot of Christians believe what they believe is because they've either seen an amazing miracle that they can't explain, uh, that maybe the, they've even seen uh, demons come out of people or they have felt this warm tingling feeling during a Christian rock concert. <laughs> it's, these are the, I think the primary reasons what really drives uh, how they see um, the evidence of the New Testament. And Paul said, if Christ was not raised, we're not gonna be raised. And Paul didn't mean just metaphor with Jesus. Because if he meant that with Jesus, then he meant that with us as well. And I want to think that my afterlife is more than just a metaphor that will exist in the minds of my loved ones who survive me. So here it is again. This is about death, right? It's, I don't want to view my resurrection as a metaphor like Crossan does. I want to view this as real. Like, and, oh, if Crossan was here, he'd be mad at me for using the word real. But anyhow, you're going to say something, Camille? Yeah, this this is actually really important. Uh, the the last clip, right? Because this is what Lacona said in the closing statements, like right before the debate ended, right? And it's actually very important. I, I think uh, you know you can see it with a lot of these apologists that one of the last thing last things that they say is like an appeal to consequences or emotions. Uh, in some cases, it's like open, right? Like they would say. Uh, yeah, when I'm on my deathbed, I'm not going to be worried about the authorship of the Gospels or whether there's an eyewitness testimony, testimony in the New Testament and stuff like that. I'll be thinking about uh, loving Jesus and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, and I've also noticed uh, Christians that you talk to do a similar thing in your conversations. They're going to be discussing uh, like historical evidence for an hour. And then when you press them, finally, after an hour, they crack and they start talking about how Christianity gives them hope and meaning and stuff like that. And I think that's the real reason why they believe. Uh, Lacona and other apologists obviously do that on purpose because they want the last thing that the audience hears from them to be this appeal, right? That's what they're, the, the people are going to be leaving with. Uh, yeah, that's, this is very important to, to, to point out. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you're, and you're exactly right. It, it, I, I'm, I'm sure there's non-Christians or atheists listening who have experienced the exact same thing. They'll spend hours and even days debating a specific point. And then at the very end, it comes down to, but you really believe we came from pond scum? Like it, or do you really think that once you die, that's just it? It's, it's like you, you're talking about these really detailed historical matters and then the real uh, oomph of what they believe comes in at the end. It has nothing to do with being an error. What we are reading is the gist of what it said. What we are reading is the gist of what Jesus said. It's an, it's an essentially faithful representation of what he said. It's not verbatim. The reason why I put this clip in here, because I think this is a good summary of that whole um, debate, in quotes, because Lacona says that the New Testament, and he gets a lot of flack from very conservative evangelical um, people for saying stuff like this, that it's a gist, it's not verbatim. But if you really think about it, Crossan says something similar. He says it's metaphor, not literal. And yeah. It 
Yeah, it's, it's it's important to point out also that even though Lacona is uh, very conservative, obviously, he was actually forced to resign from a position, and he's been tra he's been having trouble since like 2011 uh, from other fundamentalist Christians because he said, yeah, this basically specifically about the zombies in Matthew, right? He actually published a book where he argues uh, that the resurrection can be proven with uh, the historical methods. The book is 700 pages long, and but there was, there was one sentence in the book that got him fired essentially from his book, from his position. And that's about saying that, yeah, probably the zombies in Matthew are not literally true. And it's just like a divine sign that the author invented because it was a common literary practice at the time. If there was an important event like a battle or an emperor dying or being born, you would have this list of like supernatural events that signify the importance of the occasion. So that was just a common practice, right? Uh, there is a really interesting exchange of letters between Lacona and Norman Geisler, who is one of the authors of the um, Chicago, Chicago st Statement of Inerrancy, who really like uh, basically got him fired, right? He, he kind of stirred up uh, a more general um, trouble for for Lacuna for what he wrote. You know, I I honestly feel sorry for the guy. Um, yeah, me too. Like the grief, he's hearing pushback from guys like us. Although we're doing it in love, you know, we're we're critiquing the the evidence of the New Testament. Um, well, I, and plus, I'm going into the psychology of it, which is it uh, it. it is the same for me and for you. We're all human beings on this planet. We all have biases and so forth. And so we're all trying to figure out what's the best way to arrive at truth. But the stuff that Lacona has had to go through in his life, man, it's just terrible. And it's, I don't know. I, I don't know how he does it, to be honest. Um, but yeah, he's definitely one of the persecuted Christians. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hearing something in my earpiece, and this is amazing news. Um, Cam Spires is going to be able to join us in five minutes. So I'm going to play a few more clips here before we get started with the actual uh, critique video. Um, let's see what I got here. Our view of Scripture should be in accord with what we observe in Scripture, and that we must accept the Gospels and submit to them as God has given them to us rather than forcing them into a frame of how we think He should have. Now, I... I took this clip out because of what he says right here. What we observe in Scripture, and that we must accept the Gospels and submit to them as God has given them to us. As God has given them to us. And this is, you know, if we value truth, if we're seeking truth, I guess I would ask Lycona, at what point did you figure out that this was what God has given to you? Was it before or after you studied all this New Testament history? And yeah, probably, probably after, right? Uh, I don't know what his testimony is, but my guess is he was raised Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Probably. I, I can't say for certain, but I, I'm, he definitely was born and raised in the United States, um, and so the Christian culture. And it's... If you value truth, you would come from the point of view, maybe God has nothing at all to do with this book. And so this is one, I'll just call it a strategy that I think works well, that when you're talking to Christians, Muslims, Jews, whatever, give them an out. Say, let's just, for the next hour, assume God exists, he's real, that's done, you know? But now let's talk about the specific theism of Christianity or Judaism or Islam and see, you know, how we could figure out if this is actually true or not. Because it, once you, you pull away that God concept right away from the start, you know, they just like, they don't know what to do with themselves. And so <laughs> it's, it's because of what I played earlier about this. Well, I want eternal life. I want to live forever. I, I don't want to just be dead, 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 and that's it. I don't want to be viewed as just an animal, and a primate. Uh, I, I want to view love as something more than just chemicals and so forth. You know, I, I get it. I understand. Um, yeah, I mean, this specific thing basically sounds like don't think about it too much, right? Like when rubber hits the road, you just need to accept the Gospels and don't think, don't think about what you 
would expect them to say, right? Like if you start asking questions like, okay, if the if math is the if the Gospel of Matthew was written by Matthew, why doesn't Matthew say so when he's talking about himself? in the gospel right so lacona would just then probably say well you just need to accept the gospels as they were given to you by god don't think about like what you would expect them to say or what you would expect god to say which obviously like that's a circular argument right because you can't say that if your um conclusion that the gospels were uh inspired in the first place is based on historical analysis of the evidence that they contain right um yeah so my, my, my guess is that he's actually starting with the conclusion rather than reaching it, because otherwise he wouldn't say that. Uh, Cam, I think you joined us. Are you there? Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear the audio if I play um, this? Do you think that the I zombie... Can. Perfect. We're good to go. Uh, let me screen capture you in and... Uh... And Camille, oh, Camille, meet Cam. Cam, meet Camille. Uh, you're both. Um, Hi. Uh, I think you're both my favorite go to um, um, layman New Testament scholars. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. <laughs> but I'm glad, Camille, that you brought up the zombies and why that was the reason that uh, Lycona got fired because I have a clip here from um, Bart Ehrman asking, getting a bit of an echo from you, Cam. Got to get it now? You're going to have to mute my avatar in the pier. All right. Yeah, it's, it really sounded like uh, Arman is uh, rubbing it in his face, right? Because now every time this issue brings up, uh, is brought up in any discussion that Lycona is in, it's like uh, uh, putting fingers in his wounds. Yeah. But it's, it's actually a good point, right? Like if the zombies, if he admits that the zombies are probably invented, what else in the Gospels is invented, right? It's just muddies the waters so much, then probably concluding that the resurrection actually happened in some form, uh, that's probably not justified anymore. Yeah, it's a bit of a slippery slope when you start admitting some of it is met metaphorical. So, uh, Cam, again, I am hearing something in the background, so just mute yourself uh, when you're not talking. But So here is uh, Bart Ehrman asking Mike Lacona about uh, the zombies, uh, which is in Matthew, I believe, 27? I don't know. Um, and ask him if he thinks that uh, it actually happened in the past. And the reason why I'm playing this clip is because John Crossan says that Jesus rising from the dead actually didn't happen in the past. But that doesn't mean it's any less real. John Crossan believes that this is a metaphor uh, for hope uh, for humanity through justice. And, um, and so just because it's metaphor doesn't mean it's, it's any less real but it's not literal. Now listen to Lycona's answer to the zombies question, and you'll hear it's basically the same as Crossan. Do you think that the zombies happened? I, I don't think if we had been there, we would have seen the zombies. Okay. I think that that is a rhetorical literary okay. device going you, on. Is that the only thing in the Gospels that you think is not accurate? I didn't say it's not accurate. You're putting words in my mouth. Wait. If I said 9-11 was an earth-shaking event, you could say, well, that's not accurate, Mike. And I'm saying, you're missing the whole point. I'm a little frustrated because I'm not getting a direct answer. Well, I'm, I'm trying to give you, I think you're mixing genres here, and it's not fair. What's the genre of the, of the zombies? I think that this is apocalyptic kind of, apocalyptic kind of uh, 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 symbolism that's put in there. When I read, for example, let's say the last words, I have no way of telling whether an eyewitness there heard Jesus actually say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, or any of the others you want to use. Right. Okay. And everything, when I read them, tells me it looks like the authors of the gospel made up these as the appropriate last word from their Jesus in their gospel. Okay. So I can see why Luke would say, oh, Father, forgive them, they don't know what to do. And Luke would, and sorry, and John would certainly not say, my God, my God, no way is he going to say that from Mark. But so... So yeah, I, I'm playing this to just to show that 
that cross and saying, hey, look, I, I think that these gospel writers uh, made up, put the words into the mouth of Jesus, uh, probably using the Old Testament, Psalms and so forth, just like um, Michael Lacona says, oh, I think this is um, apocalyptic uh, genre. How did he put it? Um, it's a literary device. It's a, it's a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, post a post apocalyptic zombie horror genre. <laughs> so if if the gospel writers, if Lacona admits that in at least one case in the whole New Testament that that the gospel writers, or at least Matthew, is saying something that actually didn't happen, but is saying it like it did, but it actually didn't happen, maybe the last words of Jesus are like that. It didn't actually happen. And so they're, they're using this as a way to promote a message. Any thoughts, Cam? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a very reasonable um, thing to charge against Lycona that if, he's, if an author is doing it in this one situation, how can we not understand their motivations to be the same in other areas? Um, but I also agree with Crossan that um, generally in the Gospels, the authors employ this type of um, writing where they're um, trying to deliver a powerful message about Jesus by inventing details. Here's another clip I have. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Camille. I mean, yeah, d d and we have um, examples from ancient Greek and Roman literature where we have basically examples of like religious novels where you have a story uh that has a you know beginning, middle, and end. That is set in real places in history. It features real people, but the point, but the story is obviously fictional. It's got like uh, supernatural elements to it and stuff like that. Where the point of the story is not to record exactly what happened, but to teach uh, theology, basically to communicate some important points. Like if. Uh, if a Christian would be interested in reading something like that to check how it uh, compares to the Gospels, I would recommend Metamorphosis by a, game, a guy named Aplos. Uh, it's uh, something that I find very similar to a Gospel in this respect. Um, yeah. Oh, just as an aside, Cam, before you came on, did you listen to Camille and I talk? Were you listening to the live stream at all? I wasn't. I sure hope people are hearing us because I, I can't actually look right now, but I'll check soon. If someone um, in the live stream chat can, if the audio is good for all of us, let us know. If there's something wrong, let us know. This is the last clip. It's, Reed is saying that it sounds funny for me, but I'm trying to fix it right now. Yeah, it does sound a little funny for me too. So this is the last clip, and um, this is what I think everybody is a little bit confused on crossing just a little bit because... Uh, well, anyhow, I'll play the clip and I'll talk about it later. So now you're asking me, do I take literally that Jesus came out of the tomb as in the Western tradition? I at least can imagine that. I really could imagine that, taken, take that literally. I don't. But if you take it literally, and I take it metaphorically, what I really want to discuss with you is what it means for you. Because that, I think, is a first century question. I don't think if Paul takes it as literally as he wants and describes it to his Corinthians, whatever, here's what actually happened. And they say if we had a camera there, an iPhone, could we have taken a picture? And he says, yes, you could. It's funny he mentions iPhone because I actually brought that up as a hypothetical thought experiment, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago. Like, why didn't Jesus just do the miracle of iPhones for everyone, record it, and with instructions to preserve these iPhones. I think you can even carbon date some of the carbon atoms inside an iPhone. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Or some other radiometric dating to prove that it was from that time. And, you know, that would have been wonderful evidence. Then you would still have to say, well, sure, what, we've heard that story about Romulus. And the Romans are even telling it about more or less Julius Caesar. Yeah, he doesn't come out of the tomb, but the spirit goes up to God. So what are you telling us that's particularly new? Why should we care about it? Now, the reason why I'm playing this clip is because um, Crossan's really saying that the power, the realness of, the, of this gospel message is in the metaphor. And 
that doesn't mean it's any less real. And just like earlier I played when Bart Ehrman asked Michael Lacona about the zombies, Lacona says, I didn't say it wasn't accurate. I just didn't say it didn't happen in the past. And I, I'm just seeing, I'm hearing the same thing just with different words here that Lycona still th thinks it's valuable. That apocalyptic type literary device was very valuable and real uh, and powerful within the New Testament scriptures, but it didn't happen in the past. And that's what Cross is saying about the resurrection. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Crossan obviously that the resurrection didn't happen, but where I completely disagree is that Crossan actually argues that uh, New Testament authors like Paul, they themselves didn't think that the resurrection actually happened, like literally, right? He argues that uh, Paul, for example, thought that the resurrection is just metaphorical. And I think that's just wrong, right? Like if you read uh, the authentic Pauline letters, there is actually, <laughs> Paul, I think it's in First Corinthians, well, Paul specifically refutes the position that Grossan is adopting, right? He Apparently, there were some Christians who, in the, the Corinthian church, who believed that the resurrection is going to be a spiritual one, and that it actually already happened, that the, the resurrection is the, the transformation that occurred in the life of a Christian after he accepts Jesus, right? The moral reformation and stuff like that. And Paul, in the letter, actually says, no, no, no. You, you got it wrong. It's not a spiritual resurrection. It's going to be a literal resurrection. And he goes into detail explaining like that we are going to have actual bodies when we are resurrected. These bodies are going to be awesome. And he lists like how these things are going to go down. Like our bodies will be taken up to heaven. We're going to meet Jesus in the, in the air and stuff like that. So it, it, just when you read that, it becomes obvious that Paul really uh, imagined the like actual event, right? Not the metaphor. So I would argue, I would actually agree with Lacona that the New Testament authors did think that resurrection actually happened. So in this respect, it's like uh, agreeing with the flat earther, right? Like I, I do agree that uh, some of the authors of the Old Testament really did think that the earth is flat and the, the text um, kind of reflects this cosmology. But I obviously don't think that the earth is actually flat. I think they got it wrong. So similarly, I agree with Lacona that uh, Paul did imagine real resurre resurrection. I just don't think that ha it happened. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I broadly agree with that. I think that Paul in First Corinthians does uh, like an events a, a doctrine of our bodies being the same as Christ and them being real bodies, spiritual bodies that are um, that are involved in the resurrection. But it's not totally clear to me that uh, Paul believed in the type of Jesus that acted in history that the Gospels depict. So um, it's not clear exactly what he thought about Jesus specifically. Well, he thought that he had a physical body, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so it would be physical resurrection. It, did, it could have yeah. happened in the sky, as you know, Richard Carrier thinks. But uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, it would be uh, a physical body. Okay, so let's get to the actual uh, video of yeah. Crossan and Lycona. And the first uh, part I, I'm going to skip, it's basically like Kona talking about God glasses, horizons is the way he uses it, says, says it. And this is why I played those clips earlier about why I think like Kona really believes what he believes about uh, the poltergeist uh, story he heard from his friends, the, um, the huge desire and need to have eternal life, that God has inspired this, given this, the scriptures to, to him and so forth. And then, but then he gets into the what I think is the more uh, historical, interesting stuff is the um, the criteria. And so, uh, there's one criteria that I think he's missing. He lists, I think, three or four. And you guys tell me which criteria you think he's missing. Be a consensus on who Jesus is or who he was. Because of the horizons of historians, there will never be a consensus on who Jesus was. The second consideration. For us to to look at is there are three kinds of Jesuses. The first kind of Jesus we can call the historical Jesus. Now that's the kind of Jesus that historian. Oh, this is before the criteria. Uh, he talks about the three. Oh, this is 
hugely important. Because um, when people ask me, Doug, do you believe Jesus exists, existed? I say, which Jesus? And uh, so this is what he's going to talk about now. Christians can pretty much verify through using their tools and apart from faith. It's only what we can prove with Jesus with a pretty good amount of certainty. The second Jesus is the Christ of faith. The Christ of faith, we might say, is the Christ we find in our Bibles, in our New Testament. It's the Christ who existed in the form, the role of God, who is the creator and sustainer of the universe, says Paul. It's the Jesus who came down and was born of a virgin, says Matthew and Luke. It's the Jesus who, according to the Gospels, performed divine miracles and exorcisms, and then was resurrected, and right now is at God's right hand. Okay, so is everybody still with us? He's, he's up to two different types of Jesuses. There's the historical Jesus, the one that can be proved, uh, he uses the word prove, through uh, historical means, uh, methods. Uh, and the second one is what I would call the faith type Jesus, the Christ, the, the miraculous Jesus. And from there he will come to judge the world someday. That's the Christ of faith. Now, of course, there's a lot of things about the Christ of faith that the historian will never be able to verify. For example, a historian could verify that Jesus died for, uh, take the statement, Jesus died for our sins. A historian could verify the historical uh, element of that, that he died, but historians don't have the tools to say whether his death atones for sins. There's just no way a historian can do that. So things such as Jesus is deity, that can't be part of the historical Jesus. We might, the historical Jesus might be able to be Jesus claimed to be divinity, but the historical Jesus could never be he is divinity. Now, that's the Christ of faith. And then the third Jesus is the real Jesus. This is the Jesus who lived in Judea and Galilee. This is the, the actual, per, the real person who walked and lived in that time and area. Now, the real Jesus... Okay, so uh, that might be confusing to a lot of Christians listening right now. They're going, what are you talking about the real Jesus? The real Jesus is the, what you're describing as option one and option two. You got the historical Jesus that can be found through historical methods. You got the, the theological faith-based Jesus that did all the miracles. And you combine those two, you have the real Jesus. That is the real Jesus. But I think, like Kona is smart enough, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, that he recognizes that, that what we know from the first type of Jesus might be wrong, what we know from the second type of Jesus might be wrong. And so there's actually existing a third type of Jesus that really we might not ever figure out. Is that what you guys are hearing as well? Yeah, so this is basically the, this is basically the reason why Lacuna is going straight to hell. <laughs> uh, because the, the, the point behind uh, the doctrine of inerrancy, uh, let's say, is that you have these three Jesuses, right? And there is a perfect overlap, right? So, so one of the, the kind of the principles behind the, the, the doctrine is that all these, like a lot of these supernatural things, the important ones like Jesus um, really did resurrect and he's a deity and stuff like that are provable by the historical method. And it's interesting actually how Lacona goes about it in his book uh, on the resurrection. He claims that the resurrection is a real event. It happened and we can prove it using uh, the historical methods. But we can't, what we can't prove is that Jesus was resurrected because he was a god. But, uh, you know, once you conclude that the resurrection happened, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not very difficult to, to, to go that extra step, right? Probably not going to think that he was resurrected by aliens or something like that, especially not if you're a Christian that's reading the book, right? Uh, so, yeah, but, I mean, there is a lot of uh, really very conservative Christians who would uh, disagree with that. And this is one of the reasons why he's been for, uh, in trouble for a couple of years now. I have a, a huge problem with what Lycona said, and I'm not even a Christian. Um, and and I, it, it's similar to what Crossan's going to say. So I'm going to skip ahead, but I'm going to come back. But uh, where I've put the timestamp right now is Crossan basically saying, I don't know how you can separate the historical Jesus, number one, with the, the, the Christ Jesus, number two. 
don't want Jesus to go off one way and Christ to go off the other way. I want one person in there. But I would almost say crudely, Jesus is, is a fact, Christ is an interpretation. Or Jesus is history, Christ is theology. But Jesus himself is talking theology. So I don't know how to do history with Jesus and avoid theology. I do know how I could. So I don't know how to do history um, with Jesus as, his, as a historical person and also um, as a theological person because Jesus talked theology. Robert Price has a great analogy on this. And he says, look, can you really have Superman without Clark Kent? Um, can you have Clark Kent without Superman? Those two are interlinked. And so we have a real problem here. If you talk about a guy who works at a newspaper company, has a girlfriend, wears glasses, eh, no problem, right? It's very believable. Um, but now if you start saying that this guy can cut steel with his eyes, at what point do you say, use the historical method to say, well, just hang on a second. If we're going to doubt that he can cut steel with his eyes using the historical method, shouldn't we even doubt that he works for a newspaper company? Like, how do you separate those two? Because one is the alter ego of the other. I'm unsure that's the point that Carlson is making, but... I think he is. Yeah. I, th I, I think he's, he's trying to say, I don't know how to do that, how to separate the miraculous Jesus, the theological Jesus, the Christ Jesus, from the historical Jesus, the guy born in Nazareth... Uh, or Bethlehem uh, had uh, parents named Mary and Joseph and so forth. I think that's what he's trying to say here. But, okay, now the next part, he goes into the criteria. And there's a big one that I think he misses, like Kona. Jesus, what is that? All right, so we're looking at the sources. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to bring in some criteria. How do we verify things about Jesus? We're going to bring in some criteria. These are called the criteria of authenticity. These are nothing magical. They are common sense principles. They're named different things by different scholars. Some of the criteria of authenticity are rejected by scholars, like one that was used years ago that hardly anyone uses today is called the criterion of double dissimilarity. No one I want you to remember what he said. These are common sense principles. He uses that. But they will use a handful of criteria that have proved to be pretty common sense stuff and have yielded some good results. These are things like, well, if we're looking at some sources, we're going to value a source that was written by an eyewitness a little more. We're going to give it a little more weight than we would a source that's not written by an eyewitness. It's common sense, right? If we're looking at a source that's written close to the events it purports to describe, that's going to have a little more weight to it than one that was written 100, 200, 300 years later. Um, if a source reports some things that are kind of embarrassing details, embarrassing to the author or the movement that author is, uh, author is writing for, it has a better chance of being true, perhaps, because why would you make up something that's going to embarrass or discredit you? Or if there are multiple independent sources that are reporting the same event, if they can be shown to be independent and they're reporting the same thing, it's more likely to, to be reporting a true event, especially if one of those sources are an unsympathetic source versus a sympathetic source, right? So these are just, again, common sense principles. There's nothing magic about them. Um, and, you know, by using those, historians are able to construct a historical Jesus. Now, okay, he used the word, uh, the phrase, or the words common sense twice there. I think he did that on purpose. But um, I, I'm sure all three of us have a lot to say with those criteria. But the, the biggest one that I think he's missing, and this is the one that Cam, uh, I don't know, a year ago, Cam, you, you brought up this kind of method of talking to Christians and asking them about the bookshelf in the library, and you got a book, and you open it up, and you read it, something about a giant green lizard. Do you lean that towards the history section or lean that towards the, the fictional section of the library? I think that is a criteria right there that's the most common sense that anyone can think of. And if you even ask a 10-year-old child, how would you tell the difference between a book that's fictional versus a book that's uh, historical? 
that's probably an answer they're going to give. Well, if it's talking about giant green lizards or men flying around the, uh, the earth unaided just by themselves, it's probably fictional. And this is what I think Crossan has a problem with and us three guys have a problem with is we're not saying it's impossible that these miracles could not have happened. But if you're using the historical method, would you at least admit that, yeah, maybe we, you know, maybe this didn't happen because of the fantastical that we're reading? Yeah, there's um, there is a problem with uh, some of the criteria. A really good critique of this is um, proving history by Richard Carrier. If you want to kind of um, lead to criticism of these uh, criteria, that's uh, a good place to start. Uh, the, for example, the criterion of embarrassment has a problem because it basically tells you if something is embarrassing, it's unlikely to be invented. But uh, you still need an explanation for why it was preserved, right? Because uh, you know, if there's something that an author would uh, is unlikely to invent, is at the same time unlikely to preserve it because it's embarrassing. So you and any explanation that you come up with for why it was preserved is going to work as an explanation for why it was invented. But even before, so, but Camille, even before you get into the the embarrassment. Uh, criteria, which I think all three of us has weaknesses. Um, like, it, don't we take a step back and say, look, if we're talking about a man who's walking on water, like, do we start discounting the other things right next to it? Yeah. So what you're talking about, Doug, is within the um, authenticity criteria, I think is commonly referred to as the criteria of historical uh, probability or alternatively the principle of analogy and yeah you're right it's a um it's a it is a criteria that is used and it's very applicable to the gospels given that the gospels contain many accounts that have no prior analogy or no current analogy and don't, don't have, have a high prior, prior probability, probability to start with yeah, like, and Christians, please forgive me, but, you know, if you're coming from the point of view that, you know, this isn't just texts from God uh, and that, um, you know, you could still believe a God exists, there are things that you yourself as a Christian don't believe, that uh, miracle claims, that you just don't believe. You don't believe every miracle claim. So if you value truth, you just don't believe what it says in Mark or Matthew or Luke or John just because it says it, do you? Of course not. You value truth. And so I think this is a, a great, should be like the headline criteria right there. Like you need so much evidence to overcome that, in my opinion, that it makes the other criteria almost just shrivel in comparison. Yes, yeah, especially if you are willing to admit that some of the things in the text are probably invented for, to serve for literary purpose, right? So if you think, yeah, okay, the zombies probably didn't happen. It's just in the one gospel that's anonymous, late. Uh, it was a literary technique. Okay, that one probably can cross that off the list. Uh, well, that that should raise doubt about other things, right? Maybe something that's in two sources was also invented in the source that was common to that the, the two sources. No, depend no, Camille, on, right? Camille, Camille, that's not the issue here. The problem with you, Camille, is that you have a presupposition against miracles, just like Cam does. Like, this is the real <laughs> issue for you guys. Like, I want you guys to admit that. Can you admit that to well, me? Well, I, I, I have to admit that, that I've never play, played with Ouija boards. So, <laughs> but I do have to say, I, I, I want to say this. Um, so, if Mike Lacona has a definition of the supernatural, and by his definition, I do believe in the supernatural. I do think there's a supernatural realm. I just don't have reason to to include a god or a, a resurrection into it. Um, but that would be probably for a different discussion. So yeah, I mean, I totally, I, I'm totally there with him that the supernatural is real. Maybe I'm going to write a comment under the video later to explain what I mean by that. But uh, yeah, yeah, it just needs to. You're going to have a lot of atheists asking you. You're going to have a lot of atheists yeah, asking yeah, yeah. you what you uh, mean by that, so you fun. can put it in the comments. But I, I, I do confess to, to, to one account of first-degree atheism in my case, but uh, you know, <laughs> being an atheist and believing in the supernatural is not mutually exclusive. And I'm not talking about ghosts and stuff like that. Uh, just to quickly explain, uh, according, according to Lacona's definition, 
if you think that quantum entanglement is real, which it is, that counts as a, as a supernatural phenomena because it's something that science is ah, okay. like we don't know what it is. Yeah, so uh, okay. that's an example of something that's natural. right. So this is a common charge by apologists. It's a it's an easy way to um, you know set set up this ideological divide that is meant to explain why you come to your conclusion, which is different than mine. And you notice that I don't know if you played it earlier in the in the stream, but Lycona actually comes out with his opening argument by talking about these biases that um, that historians come to read the New Testament with. And I think it's, a, um, within scholarship, we should expect that the experts in the field who understand the most about methods should be the ones who are most able to get uh, objectivity and to put away bias biases in favor of methods that uh, v that hold no prior conclusion. And I think that his the historical methods that historians use do generally have that property. They don't contain within them the conclusion as like, a foregone conclusion. Um, they instead look at what the evidence leads us to on the basis of some independent set of methodologies. And um, so I disagree with the charge. I think that historically, we could actually demonstrate a miracle occurred. It's just that we need the right type of evidence for it. And unfortunately, in the case of the New Testament, it just doesn't offer that type of evidence. Um Sorry, Cam, that was the wrong answer. When someone asks you or, or puts the charge that you just have presuppositions against miracles, this is the correct answer. You say, Jews don't believe that this stuff happened and they believe in a God and miracles. I, I, I'm, being yeah, facetious. I mean, I'm being facetious, Cam. I'm not saying, you know, I'm just playing to the crowd right now but but yeah it is it's a it's it's a great way to diffuse the situation to point out there's this whole class of people um but the problem with identifying a category of people who um you know are a religious category is that that immediately falls into Lycona's um rhetorical setup his dialectic, it immediately falls into his bucket of, well, those people came to that conclusion because of their Jewish ideological biases. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a much more effective strategy is to just grant as much as possible, right? Like I would agree with Lacona that yeah, the supernatural exists, like quantum entanglement, for example. And I, I he he even goes like, later in the debate, he says there are like three hundred instances of near death experiences which are which have like really solid evidence, right? For, I don't I don't know what like near death experiences have to, have to do with the resurrection. It's uh, like two different things, right? But let's say that there are like three hundred instances of a resurrection that we can actually uh, agree took place, right? So we can say, okay, yeah, the resurrection is something that happens from time to time. I think even then, we don't have enough evidence to to, to conclude that Jesus was resurrected, right? Because the prior probability of a resurrection explaining the evidence that we have in the New Testament is still too low because, like by far, most people don't get resurrected. So even admitted, like including those, uh, however many cases of a supernatural event like a resurrection, he wants to he wants to uh, import into your worldview is that's not going to change the outcome of of the 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 inference basically. Uh, say something now, Cam. I changed something. Hello, hello. It's a Dude. little bit of echo back, but it's all right. I uh, I think I fixed it for the people listening, though. But I I hear you guys what you're saying. I I just find that when I say that I I'm open to the idea of miracles, Christians don't believe me. So I, I get the sense they don't believe me. So you were just stuck. You know, it's like what do you do at that point? But let's let's fire off um, very briefly, very quickly, why these four methods are not good in our opinion. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm going to have an argument with you here because I think that they are good. <laughs> well, sorry. Like, for example, wow. the, the first good one. Yeah, goodish. Um, the first one, I, I still think the umbrella argument is like, the, isn't it called the criteria of uh, analogy? Um, that you. Yeah, the principle yeah. of analogy. Yeah. 
But uh, uh, he said, like Kona said, um, eyewitnesses are better uh, than non-eyewitnesses. I do think that's a good criteria, but what I, what I meant to say was we don't have eyewitnesses uh, in the Gospels. <laughs> that's right. When applied to the Gospels, it's irrelevant because we don't have a good reason to well, think that. Well, like Kona thinks that we do have eyewitnesses in the Gospels, by the way, but... Yes, that's yeah. right. <laughs> but we think we don't. <laughs> Oh, I don't have the clip here, but I think he says that, uh, Camille, only for Mark and John, though, interestingly enough. He no, doubts... Uh, well, he, he mentions uh, Papias, who talks about Mark and Matthew. Um, for uh, the other two Gospels, uh, the first attestation is in Irenaeus, which is usually dated to about 180 CE, so 150 years after the crucifixion and probably about 100 years after the last gospel was written. I think we're going to talk about Papias later, uh, but yeah. um, I do agree with the criteria that closer dates are better than far away dates. Like if you, someone's writing about something that happened yesterday, it's better than 50 years from now. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that too. And you brought up before the principle of analogy. I would say that there are other way more important things um, than uh, the closer to the date aspect and even the eyewitness aspect, to be honest, which is that the sources that you're dealing with actually tell you how they received and got their information and they show you how they evaluated it um, and they effectively give something that tells you about its origin. And we don't have that with the Gospels and it's one of your the expectations are too high. Your expectations, Cam, are just way too high. Uh, we shouldn't expect that for that time period. Yeah, and this is a common retort, except there are examples of historians tracing all the way back to Herodotus that show um, the ability to deal with surface sources in a critical way. And Camille, maybe after this live stream is over, you can uh, copy and paste that list you have of all the historians from the first century who, lays, who list who they are, when they wrote, where they wrote from, and so forth. Or if they interview eyewitnesses they tell you this is an eyewitness this is their name or if they themselves enter as characters into the narrative they say i the author of this history did this and that or thucydides the author of this history was sent uh, as a as an admiral this and there yeah uh, we have the 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 authors of the gospels in the gospels as characters they don't mention that them about themselves uh, Except, of course, for the the two, uh, three instances that commonly get appealed to. One is the introduction of the Gospel of Luke. Another one is the we passages in Acts. And then the other one is in the end of John. But um, those are the only instances that we're aware of where there's any. And in fact, it, there is an instance in Mark where at least he inserts himself as an author as opposed to just writing from a third person perspective but the, it's he doesn't insert himself as a character mm. and you guys uh the gospels were written uh during the lifetime of eyewitnesses uh probably all before 70 a.d so this criteria that like Conan brought up is a good criteria and it also is works well with the gospels because we do have uh early dating yeah, no. And and by the way, there is a, an apocryphal gospel of Peter, which says in chapter 14, and then I, Simon Peter, and my brother Andrew took up our nets and went to the sea. So we actually, and the gospel is dated, by the way, to 50 to 160 CE. So it could be actually earlier. I think this is, that's a mi minority view, but could be an earlier than the canonical gospels, right? So we have a gospel that's not in the New, New Testament. It almost made it to the New Testament. And it's actually a gospel where the author identifies himself as the author. It's in, but it's probably, or almost certainly, a, a later forgery. And interestingly, Don, John Dominic Crossan, and I kind of want to pick on him for this, 
Um, he, in his reconstruction of Jesus, does actually rely on an early dating of at least some parts of the Gospel of Peter, as well as uh, early dating of some parts of the Gospel of Thomas. And as well, he relies on um, an early dating of portions of a reconstructed version of Q, um, you know, as sifted out of the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. So he, um, I'm getting a really bad echo, by the way, Doug. Uh, yeah, that's better. It's gone away now. Um, uh, Crawson, I think, relies on positions that are definitely not consensus positions within the field, and I think are probably wrong in order to reconstruct his version of Jesus. So his methods, I think, are as bad as um, like owners. Well, yeah, I'm just convinced you guys uh, purposely and historians purposely make the dates late because they have they just want it to be false and they don't want to know the truth of jesus and that's that <laughs> that's you know i hear that yeah, so many I times just, yeah can i just say one thing about the criteria that the, my biggest problem with that is that they always tell you like okay like uh, uh, an early source is better than a late source but they don't tell you like how early is good enough to warrant belief in what the text says right so let's say that a claim is only found in one source, but the source is really early. Is that good enough? Or a different claim is found in two sources, but they are both anonymous and they are like late-ish, right? So is that good enough? You know, like we have, let's say three or That's four, right. maybe, like independent lines of evidence, maybe in the New Testament, right? Like Paul, uh, some pre-Pauline oral traditions, whatever, that's not independent from Paul, but let's say it's maybe independent from the Gospels. Then we have synoptics, and then we have John, if, assuming John didn't didn't know about the synoptics. Uh, so if something like the, the, the uh, virgin birth, it's only in two of these, should we believe it? It's 50, or is it 50-50, you know? It's God's that's, word. That's yeah. question. That, that's and a question that's not not enter, answered uh, by by the criteria. So you you have to go by like what prior probability, basically, uh, and the criteria can then increase it or or they they could uh, keep it really low. Uh, so yeah, what's the prior probability of a virgin birth? Probably not very high, right? So two relatively late, uh, well actually one relatively late source because Mark and Luke, uh, Matthew and Luke are not uh, mutually independent. Uh, this is probably not good enough. Yeah, and this um, problem is discussed under the name of the threshold problem by Carrier in the book that you cited earlier, um, uh, uh, Proving History. And yeah, it is. It's difficult. Well, what, have, what do you do when you have one criteria that points in one direction and another criteria that points in another direction? Um, what do you do when you have um, a couple that point in one direction and a couple that point in another direction? It's, it's very difficult, and the methodology doesn't actually tell you what you need to do in that situation. And that's probably why there's so much divergence in the field in their application. I want to move yeah, on. So, so since we are, yeah, yeah, let, let's move on. Uh, we would be geeking out uh, online. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling the pulse of the of the fans out there. Um, but my advice to people talking to Christians about this stuff, and they just say something like, "Oh, but it's because those are secular historians. You can discount them. They have a bias against this." Just remind them that there's a lot of Christians out there who love Jesus who don't think these are eyewitness accounts who don't think these are early dates, who acknowledge problems with the criterion for, for embarrassment, who admit there's a synoptic problem and that these are not fully independent sources, and they still believe. So this is, maybe that will give you a little bit of comfort as a Christian that this is not just these, these uh, people under the power of Satan who are trying to blind the, the eyes of the children and lead, lead them to hell this is no this is these are people who are professionals who are just trying to do the best they can and um and there's great um uh controversy on a lot of these things which should lower our confidence 
So the only one I think left that we haven't dug into um, is the independent aspect. So we definitely would agree, right, that uh, sources being independent of one another yet claiming the same event occurred is a is a positive sign. That's something that should increase our confidence. But as applied to the New Testament, um, I think it's difficult because even with, for example, your mention of these possible independent sources before, I don't think that we have an ability to establish that. For example, I don't think that we can establish that Mark is independent of Paul. Um, I also don't think that uh, Q can be established as an independent source and be used for historical details because we have like no uh, we have no ability to analyze its uh, its origin or its veracity because it's a hypothetical reconstructed source. And I think the same thing goes for Thomas and um, and Peter. Uh, there are scholars that have argued that Peter. Uh, the Gospel of Peter is dependent on the synoptics as well as the Gospel of Thomas that gets argued by Mark Goodacre. So it's all, I mean, it's hard to see if there are any independent sources except for Paul. And uh, yeah, it's it's a problem. Okay, let's pick on uh, Dominic, uh, John Dominic Crosta now for a little bit. Um, in this clip, he's going to be talking about his his whole concept of what he means by metaphor, literal, and so forth. And another distinction. The distinction between the metaphorical and the literal. Don't confuse them between the metaphorical and the real. That's a fatal mistake made after the, it's the dark side of the enlightenment. It's the endarkenment that is the other side of the enlightenment, the loss of metaphor. Metaphor creates reality if you start living by it. Bad metaphor, bad result. Good metaphor, good results. Now, for example, before Jesus ever existed, and had he never existed, there was a human being in the Mediterranean world of the first century and the preceding one, whose titles were Lord, Son of God, God incarnate, Savior of the world, even Redeemer from sin, and of course I'm talking about Caesar the Augustus. And when you hear Caesar the Augustus, think of Jesus the Christ. Augustus is not his family name. It's his title the one to be worshipped, from Sebamai. Now, is that metaphorical or literal? Did Augustus get up in the morning and say, God wants breakfast? On the other hand, it would be very unwise to say, you do understand, your imperial highness, you're just a metaphor. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Because it's real, in that mysterious way that you would never say it's just a metaphor. Because it's creating the reality of the Roman world. I always think... He... I have a question. Yeah. Is John Dominic Crossan uh, Jordan Peterson's dad? <laughs> no, uh, but he actually reminds me a little bit of... Um the thoughts and opinions of um, uh, Ronald R. McDonald that we had on. Does he remind you of that, Cam? Of him, Cam? He, kind of viewing Jesus yeah. in that way? Yeah, he reminds me a lot of, um, of uh, McDonald's reconstruction of Jesus, in particular, the focus on the morality side of things. So I, I really don't have much to comment on this other than to say that I think he's a great orator. I think he's very good at, at what he does uh, presenting like this. His voice goes up a little too much once in a while. But <laughs> um, I, I think the best part of what he's doing here is he's giving Christians an out. Because for myself as a fundamentalist Christian, cons very conservative for like 30 years, I never thought I had an out. 
And he's giving people who might be struggling with cognitive dissonance a type of out that, look, you can still believe in this metaphor and you don't have to like uh, try to convince yourself that a man walked on water and turned water into wine and rose from the dead because, you know, part of you just thinks like, no, that's that sounds a little too far fetched for me. Um, the real meaning is in, you know, this whole idea of justice and nonviolence and so forth. Anyhow, you guys have any other so, comments? Yeah, Crossan actually wrote a book uh, titled How to Read the Bible and Still Be a Christian. Oh, okay, <laughs> there you go. I've never read that book. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the problem that I have with this is that like, if this ma view becomes mainstream, then Christianity is going to die out because like, there are some denominations in Europe that have adopted this view for years now. Like you can actually find quotes from some of the highest ranking members, like priests and bishops in the Church of England, for example, when they say, yeah, we don't really think that the resurrection happened. We think that the miracles are just, uh, it's, they are not real events. The, the important thing is the moral story. But the, the problem is that the Church of England is not really doing very well. And the thing is, like, if I became convinced that what Crossan is saying makes sense, I would have no problem calling myself a Christian then. Like, if the important thing is the, the moral message and you don't care about history, that I would be a Christian. But the problem is that I would also probably be a Jew, a Muslim, a pagan because there is a lot of stuff in the Greek and Roman history that I really like. And I think it's like deep and meaningful and stuff like that, right? So what's, what's the point of going to church, eating uh, bread and, and drinking wine and stuff like that? I, yeah, I think you're... Go ahead, uh, you go. No, no, you go, you yeah, go. It's the same, same thing uh, with some members of the Episcopal Church, like John Shelby Spong. It's, it's, I think it's a trajectory of the religion that's kind of, it's going to die. Like it, there's not enough to cling on to, to make it unique, to create a group identity that survives through the ages. I find it interesting you brought up Romulus, uh, cause I just did a video on that. Um, but anyhow, um, now we get into some more meat uh, with the criteria of eyewitnesses. Uh, the, the moderator asked four questions. I'm, I think I'm only going to talk about we're going to talk about one, maybe two, and then wrap this up. And so the first question was, are the, eye, are the Gospels eyewitness accounts? Or con no, do they contain eyewitness accounts? If I, if I let them drift totally away. Good. Thank you both. Question one. Dr. Lacona, we'll start with you. Do the Gospels contain eyewitness testimony? Oh, I would say yes. Um, and I would uh, I'd say yes, definitely. Um, I would especially say that would be the case definitely. Uh, with Mark and, and John. Um, Mark, you've got, let, let's go with Mark here because ev almost everyone agrees that's the first Gospel to have been written. So we've got Papias, a guy named Papias, and both Irenaeus and Eusebius say that uh, Papias was affiliated with one of the apostles, uh, whether it was John, uh, the son of Zebedee, or another, a minor disciple named John the Elder, of course, is disputed. But they were, he was affiliated with one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, in his Chronicon, um, you have Eusebius putting uh, Papias, Polycarp, Clement, uh, or, yeah, Clement, with uh, the Apostle John right after the 219th Olympiad and right before the 220th Olympiad. And the 220th Olympiad was the year 101. So he says Nerva, uh, was, he served for a year and a few months, and then he died. And then uh, I think it was Trajan that took over, and uh, he served, I think it was... I just want to remind uh, everybody listening, the question was, do the, eye, do the Gospels represent, contain eyewitness accounts? And, and Lycona is going into, he has about another minute or so left talking about Eusebius, Papias, and so forth. And, but he's trying to answer this question. For 19 years, and um, it was during uh, Nerva's time that John, the son of Zebedee, was released from exile. And then he says that his successors, you know, the apostolic successors or, or John's uh, disciples would have been like Papias and Polycarp and um, you name some of these folks. So that seems, Eusebius seems to be putting Papias before the year 101. 
Now, whether Papias wrote his interpretations of the, his five volumes of the interpretations of Jesus' discourses, um, we don't know. It could have been a couple decades later. But he would have gotten his information from this disciple of Jesus during the first century. And Papias says that Mark, Papias said that the disciple, this disciple of Jesus told him that Mark got his information from Peter. He wrote down what he remembered Peter saying. So here we've got this guy, Papias, who heard directly from one of Jesus' disciples that Mark was writing down what he heard directly from Peter. That's pretty remarkable. Okay, don't say anything yet, guys. Don't say anything yet. I know you're just chomping, especially Camille's chomping at the bit here, trying to contain himself. Let me um, summarize for everyone what Michael Lacona just said. Uh, let's see, is this the one? Oh, I have to get rid of Cam here for a second. Oh, no, I'll just... Um... <laughs> can't, just can't get rid of you, Cam. Uh, because Cam came in late, that's why. Okay. So this is what uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Lacona is saying. So Christians know that Mark is an eyewitness and wrote the Gospel of Mark because Eusebius said over two centuries later that he read Papias, which we can't confirm because we don't have any of Papias' writings, that Papias said that a guy named John, who could be the disciple or some other guy, we just don't know, who somehow heard that a guy named Mark got his information about Jesus from a disciple of Jesus named Peter at a time when all these people would have been most likely dead. Uh, feel free to screen capture this. And whenever someone, a Christian, says, I know these are eyewitness accounts because of Eusebius or Papias, this is basically, now this is a very bad way to put it for the Christian, but this is essentially what um, Michael Lacona is saying. Okay, who wants to shred this apart first, Cam or Camille? Why don't you go ahead first, Cam? No, you go, Camille, because you look excited. <laughs> also, but first of all, do you think that that's an accurate summary? Well, like, yeah, we worked on it together, kind of. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I, yes. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it puts it in probably the worst kind of light. But, yeah, I think it, it, got, it has the essentials in there. And what would you put, like, the probability at? Not your assessment of it, but Mike's assessment of each one of those steps in the logical chain. Whoa, that's a great. I mean, like, like, like on us assessment. Yeah, like, what do you think his confidence, his confidence is in each step of the logical chain? Well, the first, the first one, UCB is that's clear. We have that extent, right? Um, the second one that Papia said, a guy named John. Well, he uh, he com Lacona then here completely ignores what UCB says because U UCB actually says that Papia didn't know any eyewitnesses of Jesus, and he himself Papia actually says that. So UCB is saying that if you read what Papia said about his sources, Papia is saying I didn't know any eyewitnesses to Jesus. So that's that's a point that Lacona uh, completely. Um, completely dismisses or ignores, uh, which is important. <laughs> uh, can I show? Hey, Camille, uh, let me show that. Let me show that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, from Eusebius Church History 3.39.3. .3. Yet Papias himself, in the preface uh, to his discourses, certainly does not declare that he himself was a hearer and eyewitness of the holy apostles, but he shows by the language which he uses that he received the matters of the faith from those who were their friends. Their friends. Okay, go on. Yes. So the the guy named John. There is the the idea is that this this could be John, the son of Zebedee, the author of the Gospel of John. But there is obviously a number of problems that uh, we the number of reasons why this is probably not correct. He would be dead by then because Papias is too late. Uh, one really funny thing is. Uh, there is a fragment of the writings of Papias where Papias said that John, the son of Zebedee, was actually martyred together with his uh, brother James. And the martyrdom of James is recorded in Acts and it's dated to 44 CE, which means that the source of Papias died about 15 years before Papias was born. So 
there's a number of reasons why this John is not uh, an apostle. And also, let's say that this uh, this John is actually the the author of the, the the Gospel of John, right? And that he is an eyewitness to Jesus. Now, why would being an eyewitness to the life of Jesus make you a more reliable source of information about who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Wouldn't you need an eyewitness to the Gospel of Mark being written? And this is important because according to the tradition, John, the son of Zebedee, was actually exiled and he spent uh, a couple of decades uh, in exile. That's the tradition which says he wasn't killed together with his brother, right? So either he was killed really early on or he was sent to exile and he was released around 100 CE, about 40 years after both Peter and Mark were already dead. So if he was in exile, how, how did he know who wrote the, the, the Gospels of Mark and Matthew? And there's a couple of other reasons why we think that uh, Babius is wrong about uh, these Gospels. The Gospels that he's talking about are probably not the Gospels that we have today. Um, and I have about 10 other reasons listed. Yeah, one of the short ones is that he um, says something about Matthew, which we don't believe to be true about the Matthew that we have, in particular that it was written in the Semitic, or I think maybe that it was written in, in Aramaic. Or was it Hebrew? Yeah. I don't remember yeah, which he, he claims. Says Hebrew. It, it he can says mean Hebrew. either Hebrew or Aramaic. He also says that, that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, was is a collection of sayings. Uh, which means like a Gospel of Thomas, right? So it would be just a collection of like things that Jesus said without any story. That's obviously not the Gospel of Matthew that we have. And he even says that uh, each person interpreted the sayings as best as he could, which suggests that there wasn't any like surrounding narrative. While if you read uh, the Gospel of Matthew that we have, the, the, the things that Jesus said are often explained later right to the disciples and he also says something about the gospel of mark which is not true about the mark that we have now and it he says that mark uh the gospel lacked a rhetorical arrangement again that uh, sounds like a just a collection of sayings but of course uh, mark is a very nice uh, rhetorical arrangement right so probably the th that this is a general problem with these early attestations to gospel authorship there are people who say yeah the gospel of mark but we don't actually know if the text that they had in front of them is the text that we have today it could be just a different book that was also attributed to mark or matthew and stuff like that right it's only a couple of decades later when we have people like clement for example who really started quoting from the gospels extensively where we can tell that yeah it's pretty much the same text that we have today even though like we you still have people that are quoting from these gospels things that are not in the gospels today or they don't know about things that we do have for example origin says that uh jesus being a carpenter is not in any gospel that exists and that this is the middle of the third century. I want to keep, I want to dumb this down just for 30 seconds before Cam comes in. Just as a reminder for people listening, Lacona is saying a guy named Eusebius says a guy named Papius says a guy named John says a guy named Marx heard it from a guy named Peter. Okay. Now, if this was any other religion, you would be going, what? We're supposed to be confident from every link of that chain? Okay. Um, but okay, now Cam, go ahead. Oh, and they're probably all dead, by the way, if, if the, these are late datings. That's another big <laughs> yeah, stickler almost here. Certainly. Yeah. So yeah. this is one of the fundamental problems I see with the type of Christian apologetics that attempt to, um, you know, beef up the historicity of the New Testament, is that they practice this um, uh, rhetoric of omission. That is, in their arguments, they put forward things without addressing the wider um, body of knowledge that we've gained about the New Testament. And this is like very applicable when trying to claim that the Gospel of Mark derives from an eyewitness source, Peter. So here are some facts about Mark. Um, that, for example, that I've argued for in a separate video on Pine Creek's channel called uh, the Top Ten Markers for Historicity. Um, Mark 
freely invents stories on the basis of uh, prior uh, sources, but not sources related to the historical Jesus. Um, for example, the Barabbas narrative um, is full of historically implausible events, but yet the story as a whole contains obvious symbolism that demonstrate its fictive composition. As well, the fig tree narrative also contains a very wide uh, theological and uh, moral message about what the destruction of the temple means, um, yet it's um, inserted in a in a manner that demonstrates or that um, you know puts historical uh, Jesus as a historical figure saying these certain things and doing certain acts. So how can we trust a source that um, as being from an eyewitness when it's late dated after the destruction of the temple and it contains clearly uh, fictional composition. And that just grates against this idea that he was working with an eyewitness source. Yeah. But Lycona doesn't address that at all. He doesn't even bring it up. I, I, I really want to move on. This is great stuff. Um, uh, I just wanted to point out one thing. We've been talking about Mark. Uh, bring, to bring up, go back to John for a second. The Gospel of John even tells you that John the disciple didn't write it. And I know what Lycona says about this, but... Um, Let's see, the saying spread among the brethren that this is disciple who uh, was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. Um, this is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things, uh, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. The disciple that Jesus loved is the one who is saying these things to this person who's, who's actually writing it. it. And so the only way the Christian like Mike Lacona can get around this is saying that... that um, that the author of John is is like George Costanza from Seinfeld. George is getting upset. George is hungry. You know, it's like he's talking about himself in the third person. And it's just, there's a great clip of uh, Airman just really going, really? <laughs> to Michael Lacona about that point. Um, but now we, all three of us, don't have a PhD in New Testament history. So let's listen to a real historian uh, give an answer uh, to this question. And then the majority of scholars today, Johannine specialists, do agree that John, even though they don't think it was John the son of Zebedee, uh, there are a few of us who do, um, but uh, even though they don't think it was John the son of Zebedee, they do think that the author of John's gospel was either one of Jesus' minor disciples or that the author used one of Jesus' disciples, perhaps John the son of Zebedee, or a minor disciple, as one of their primary sources behind that gospel so yeah, yeah we've got some good evidence that that. that's some, uh, yeah that's that's bullshit can we like crowd can we just crowdfund uh, a survey of new testament scholars because like you you hear these claims left and right like the the consensus of the scholarship is this or the majority of the scholars but there's no data on that and, but, and there are surveys of scholars, like there is a survey of philosophers where they ask them like specific questions about different philosophical like positions. And that's data. Now you can say actually, uh, yeah, a majority of philosophers are, for example, scientific realists, right? So can we please do something like that with New Testament scholars? Uh, shouldn't be that difficult to do, right? Uh, there's like 6,000 of them, something like that. Uh, it's really irritating. It is irritating, and my reading of um, the scholarship on John doesn't bear out uh, Lycona's claims, but um, maybe I'm just reading different literature than he is. Yeah, I think uh, what he what he's uh, kind of the the he's kind of twisting what he's twisting is basically this: there is a, a an idea that there was something like a Johannine community that produced this gospel. But just because it's called the Johannine community doesn't mean that there was a John, son of Zebedee, uh, like behind it or founding it or something like that. It's called the Johannine community because it produced the gospel that's traditionally uh, ascribed to John. 
but that's like the opposite. Like that's uh, working from the con backwards from the conclusion, right? Shouldn't be. It wasn't actually a Johannine community. We just call it that because the gospel that they produce is called the Gospel of John. I guess this is like what he's working from, but it's definitely not true that the majority of New Testament scholars think that either a, uh, John son of Zebedee wrote it, or he was a, an eyewitness the source or some other minor disciple called John, which uh, I don't know where he gets that from. Yeah, there's uh, some Christian New Testament uh, historians who think Lazarus wrote uh, the Gospel of John, uh, but then there's other New Testament historians who think Lazarus is a complete fiction made as a contrast to the Lazarus in the Gospel of Luke. But this is um, Dr. Crossan's answer to the question, does the Gospels contain eyewitness testimony? Eyewitness testimony in the Gospels. All right, let's start with a no, and I qualify it. First of all, we say the four Gospels, and I say it too. There's only one Gospel, the Gospel according to. That's profound for me. It's not the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. It's the Gospel according to. There's only one Gospel, which is Jesus. Four versions. I think Paul would say my, mine too, so five versions. Okay, five versions. Gospel is not a fact. It's an interpretation. Good news. If, if to take your example before, I said, good news, Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court. Fair enough, I have a fact, he is, and I have an interpretation. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but somebody else could say bad news, he's on it. Those are the two interpretations of a fact. So gospel is an interpretation. Now, if I looked at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from scratch and knew nothing about it, my first th wouldn't be, these, these must be four eyewitnesses trying to tell, you know, what happened. And look, they come up kind of pretty much with the same general structure. So, yeah, these must be four eyewitnesses. But then I, when I actually study it, and I, as an heir of a hundred years of study, I find out, no, Mark is copied by Matthew and Luke. But I thought Matthew was supposed to be the one who was there. And he has no trouble changing Mark with a certain consistency, not just at random. Did uh, now, there might be some Christians watching this now or during the replay and go, what in the world is, is Dr. Crossan talking about that Matthew changed Mark? Do you guys want to give some examples of... Um, so Crossan's point is, like, why in the world would... Uh, not, if Matthew's an eyewitness, why is he looking at what Mark wrote and purposely changing it. Does it make sense? Okay, don't all jump uh, on once. I'll, I'll one yeah. chance. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, one thing that I remember when I was a Christian kind of thinking, oh, this is really bizarre once I started looking into it was the triumphal entry. Um, it seems like uh, one of them has uh, Jesus coming in. It says on them, two cults. Uh, one says on it, one. And so they both, um, I think one corrects the other. The other one was on certain quotes from Isaiah. Uh, one included Malachi and bundled it with Isaiah. And Matthew saw that and said, no, that's wrong. And so he fixed it. Um, can you guys think of any others? So yeah. Can we talking about at the beginning of the gospel when he's talking about the uh, John the Baptist. Yeah, right before that, uh, Mark opens with uh, what he calls, uh, you know, according to Isaiah, but he actually mixes up Isaiah with Malachi. And some manuscripts of Mark actually recognize that as a mistake, and they change the, the text to according to the prophets, because they realize that Mark got it wrong, or the author of Mark the Trunk, and Matthew later changes it, changes actually the the, the prophecy to, so that it's 100% uh, from Isaiah. That's one example. Uh, the other one, which I really like, is, well, th th the point is that when Matthew changes Mark, he usually changes it to make his gospel more Jewish. So he either corrects some some mistakes, uh, some discrepancies, discrepancies, or he actually makes uh, Jesus's teachings more consistent with existing Jewish scriptures and rites. Right. So, for example, in both Gospels, there is the the scene where Jesus preaches against divorce. That's the famous "What uh, God joined, uh, let no man separate," something like that. 
and in in mark uh, you are not allowed to divorce uh, period but actually met you as an exception uh, in cases of unchastity of a woman uh, and that makes it more consistent with the previous mosaic law right so if you are a guy who divorced your wife because she was unfaithful you are breaking uh, what jesus said if you're reading mark but you're okay if you're reading matthew right so the point is that these changes are always in the in the direction of making the gospel of matthew more jewish and just think about it like if the traditional authorship is correct mark is based on peter and what we know about peter from paul peter was preaching the gospel of circumcision he was preaching a highly jewish version of the christian gospel and Ma what do we know about matthew matthew was a tax collector who by his own gospel was alienated from the religious jewish community because he was perceived as a sinner and as a roman collaborator basically so why would this guy needed to change a gospel that was based on teachings of basically a Jewish rabbi in a direction of making it more Jewish. That just doesn't make any sense, right? Probably the gospel of Mark was written by some either Gentile or Jew who lived uh, not in Palestine decades later. And Matthew was written by someone who was in, the, in a more let's say Judaized Christian community who thought that uh, if you wanted to become Christian, you should still follow the the Jewish law basically. Yeah. You're muted, Cam. There you go. I have two other hopefully quick examples. Uh, one is in um, uh, the baptism scene of Jesus where Ma uh, Matthew, um, in redacting his source Mark, appears to introduce this reluctance of John the Baptist to baptize Jesus. In particular, he introduces John saying, um, but John tried to deter him saying, quote, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Um, and, and then John consented. And then the other instance is um, in the recounting of the what I think is a fictional story of um, based on prior literary sources um, of uh, John the Baptist's be beheading, there's a different depiction of Herod's disposition towards John the Baptist and an introducing, uh, introduction of the reluctance of um, Herod to, uh, to have John the Baptist killed and almost like this disappointment on Herod, uh, by Her Herod um, that uh, it's requested that John the Baptist's head gets delivered on a silver platter. I, I forgive me for dumbing this down a little bit, but um, for Christians watching or listening on the replay, even if you disagree with everything that Camille and Cam are saying or what Cross is saying, and you just want to believe these as eyewitness accounts, I think you would agree that two of the four Gospels are at least direct eyewitness accounts, Matthew and John, and so you're you're you've cut the Gospels in half, and of what the content of Matthew and John, they weren't. Matthew wasn't there for the birth of Jesus, so he didn't see that with his own eyes. So you could probably cut out another twenty-five to fifty percent. So at best, maybe a third of all the Gospels are direct eyewitnesses. From your, I'm even just assuming everything that you believe is true that these are eyewitnesses and so forth. At best, maybe a third is direct eyewitness, and the rest is I heard it from an eyewitness, and. Now, I know you don't like this word, but that, in legal terms, is called hearsay. And so even the best-case scenario, you have maybe a third direct eyewitness and the rest hearsay. But I want to get to, um, we're going to let Cross and finish up, and then I want to get to the, the last question, is did Jesus rise from the dead? Because I've never, uh, I, I'm, I'm still a little stuck on that one, if that's, if it actually happened or not. So from Luke, so if I put them in parallel columns and read them that way, I have to face this. Now, I don't think that's any way to write the gospel. I think there should be only one version in there. But Tatian and Martian in the second century thought that too. They should be all collapsed into one or get rid of them all and keep only one. He wanted Luke. So 
it is a weird thing that we only have one Jesus, but have four interpretations of Jesus, all of which are good news. So I'm kind of stuck with that. I don't think it's any way to write a gospel, to be honest with you. It's well, certainly not the way I would have done. It's problematic, though, to the question of whether there is eyewitness testimony in the gospel. Yes, let me get to that then. So what you were describing there, by the way, in a court of law is called hearsay, not eyewitness. But my problem is, I'm sure there's, there's of, of eyewitness. Of course, that, that could be said about any author. That could be said about Plutarch. It could be said about Suetonius. Well, if they're claiming, like, for example, Jesus said yeah. in Mark, okay, Mark is the first one. So let's say he's got it right. Let's, let's say he was an eyewitness. How dare Matthew and Luke change it? Well, why? When we look at the Because they don't think it's eyewitness. They think it's gospel. And no, Matthew's, Matthew's willing to say, huh, who are you, Mark? I, this is my you. I, I would guess that you're probably like most, and I, I might even agree with it, that the titles, the gospel according to Matthew, according yeah. to Mark, etc., weren't in the original. So what we have here are four biographies of Jesus. And the question is, even, and even if Matthew is using Mark, which he most certainly is, in, in my opinion as well, um, the compositional textbooks written by Theon and Hermogenes and Athonius and Quintilian, they all say you should change things, you should paraphrase. And we see this is exactly yeah, what the Gospel authors are doing. Yeah, but unfortunately in this case, um, the compilers of the New Testament had the bad taste to keep Mark in there so we can see them at work. But, I but, can see Matthew change them. But we can say, do... Yeah, that's, that's the, the nail in the coffin. We can see them at work. We can see the changes flow, um, the details increase, and so forth. Yeah, what's uh, just just real quick? What's important to, to 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 realize is that if you actually compare the changes between the gospels, you see that they are not random. Like it, if there is a change, the cha you can clearly see that the changes have a purpose, right? For example, from from Mark to Matthew. It's usually to make the gospel uh, more like Jew Jewish, basically, right? More consistent with the Jewish law and Jewish practices and stuff like that. This is really hard to explain if the traditional authorship is correct and if the gospels are actually based on eyewitnesses, right? But it's really easy to explain if you assume that the different authors were basically rewriting each other and they had different theology to some extent they wanted to tell a different story and they wanted to communicate like different points across. If you accept that, then you have a very nice hypothesis that actually explains the data, right? Assuming that the traditional uh, authorship is true doesn't allow you to do that. If you, if you work with a traditional authorship, then you really need to like contort yourself into very ad hoc uh, explanations like, well, maybe Matthew didn't know about that, or maybe Peter forgot, or uh, you know they both knew about the story, but one just decided to tell one half of it and the other uh, the the second half, right? It's just a better explanation. Yeah, well, and Lycona's explanation can be found in his book Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? And a lot of his explanation appeals to the existence of the same type of thing occurring in other sources, like these different uh, literary techniques that authors use that, from our modern perspective, um, affect their accuracy, but he uses their commonality in the ancient world to justify why the gospel authors were allowed to do it without them being without it being wrong. Um, but I also want to point out that um, that Lycona here, I think he really um, he misleads the crowd when he appeals to the concept of biography because. People in the modern world, when we think about what a biography is, we usually consider a biography of a real person, somebody writing it who was close to the events, and typically a pretty accurate depiction of somebody's life. But in the ancient world, we have biographies that exist that are written in this, you know, uh, bio biography style. I mean, I would argue whether or not the Gospels really are that, but but they nonetheless, despite being written in this fashion, contain immense amounts of myth. In fact, we have biographies written of people who historians today don't even think existed. 
So how valuable is a genre if yet that genre can contain complete mythological details that have no association with reality? Well, say that again, Cam. Uh, That was important, that there's historians today from that time period that there's biographies of people who didn't even exist? Well, a good example is um, uh, Plutarch, who is an author who uh, Lycona appeals to quite regularly. And in particular, he appeals to his li- his literary devices. Uh, Plutarch writes these parallel lives where if you look at early in the list, it has figures like Theseus and Romulus and people like this who we don't even think existed. Yet he was writing lives of them. Yeah, and he also he also writes uh, the life of Alexander, and uh, it starts with the description of how Alexander's father Philip lost an eye because he was watching a god Zeus having sex with his wife in the form of a snake, and uh, that's how he like threw a keyhole, and Zeus got angry, so he made him lose his eye. Do we believe that? Probably not. Uh, and but by the way, uh, just one minor point. Lacona mentioned Plutarch and Suetonius. Uh, Plutarch, in one point, uh, mentions that his great uh, great uh, grandfather was an eyewitness to an event, and Suetonius mentions that his father was an eyewitness to an event. It would be nice if we had something like that in the Gospels, especially if the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. Just saying. Well, and yeah, th- I think that's a great point. And Plutarch isn't a particularly great historian from the ancient world because his primary purpose for writing the parallel lies was actually to focus on moral parallels by diff- of different ancient figures. And then they're not like their primary purpose isn't a type of like very accurate historical biography. And we understand that because it's 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 evident across the whole body of Plutarch's work, whereas in the Gospels, um, you know, they want to maintain that these were meant to be highly accurate things, despite us once again trying to put forward a position that these biographies, their primary purpose isn't to depict what really happened in history. They're instead to talk about important aspects of the moral message of this character of Jesus and the theological role that he plays within the Christian worldview. And he just can't see that. Okay, I want to uh, move on to the last question. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Um, I'm going to skip the section where Crossan talks. Uh, spoiler alert, he says yes, but it's metaphorical, not literal. And it's very, very real. Uh, he keeps pointing that out. And uh, in my notes here, I, ha- I have here that Lycona gets punchy with, um, with Crossan. So let's see if I can find that part. And when we look at how the skeptics responded to it, They said the disciples stole the body. The gardener reburied the body. Jesus faked his death. And the Christians, so they understood the Christians to be claiming it as a a literal event. And notice how the Christians did not respond. They didn't say, get over it. It's just a metaphor. It doesn't matter. Are you living the Christian life? No, they defended the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So I think we have every reason to believe that the resurrection was meant to be understood as a real event. Oh, and I paused at the right moment. He said real event, and this triggers uh, Crossan. But you were going to say something, Cam? It really does trigger Crossan. And it's funny because he has been emphasizing it throughout the talk, yet Lycona still does it. Um, uh, What I was going to say is this is just displaying Lycona's credulousness um, or credulity. He is taking the Mythian account of the guards posted at the tomb of Jesus as being something that we can actually trust historically as demonstrating that there was a, in the time of Jesus' death, active theory that the disciples stole the body. But (laughs) I don't think we have any reason to think that at all. Matthew isn't actually evincing knowledge of a tradition that traces back right to the burial of Jesus. He is um, using literary constructions, um, the same kind of uh, literary constructions we find within uh, Daniel in the Lion's Den and uh, uh, other types of literature to make the story even bigger and even more important. Um, And 
I just don't understand how he uh, he thinks that Mark was an earlier written source, yet he thinks that Mark forgot somehow to mention this incredibly important detail that the Romans posted guards at the tomb. <laughs> like, it's just yeah, ridiculous. Especially if Mark is based on Peter, right? Because Peter went apparently, allegedly, to the tomb to, to check it out, right? So where the guards gone by them. Uh, but also like in Matthew, Matt, the gospel of Matthew actually tells you what the guards did afterwards, that they went to the first, to the Sanh Sanhedrin. And it's basically tells a conversation that the guards had with the Jewish council. And if the, that actually happened, it's very difficult to come up with the theory of how that information got to Matthew. It's uh, more likely that he just invented uh, that conversation, right? Because that's a conversation where we, he didn't have a source. So Chris, exactly, the author's omniscience. Yeah. So uh, conservative Christians listening in right now, like Kona just said, well, this has to be literal because why would they put guards at the tomb? I'm going to play a clip of someone who I think you respect. His name is William Lang Craig. Please listen closely. Uh, most scholars don't accept the historicity of the guard story. <laughs> there you go. I hope you heard that. <laughs> um, okay, let's keep it going here. And no really good reasons to think that it wasn't. And in terms of the Eastern tradition, I, I've read Dominic's stuff. He appeals to the Odes of Solomon, which is a hymnal in the early second century. I mean, I don't appeal to hymns like in the garden, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. I mean, that's poetry. It's not meant to be interpreted. There's flexibilities in it. He goes with two frescoes in churches in Egypt, built in the fourth and fifth century. Art. He goes with the Gospel of Peter, which by his own admission is middle of the second century. He says it's even dependent on all four Gospels. It's preserved in a single fragment dated 550 plus years after Jesus. And based on that, hypothesizes a cross gospel for which there isn't a scrap of evidence and for which he hasn't been able to convince a single other scholar in the universe. So, yeah, I agree with everything that he says. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Um, it's almost three o'clock. I'm getting a little tired. Um, I'm trying to, a lot of this stuff at the end I already played and Cam, you missed, but they do their summations their closing statements and, and Crossan, of course, just keeps um, pushing that narrative that this is metaphorical. It's not literal, but it's very rear, uh, real. And, um, and Lycona goes into the appeal to emotion, which is, um, hey, look, I don't want to believe that this is metaphorical. I'm going to believe that someday I'm going to rise like Jesus. And, um, and so I played that earlier. And in the Q&A, there was, I think, two Christians who got up and asked Cross in the same question, like, are you serious? Like, what hope is there in the metaphorical? Like, real beats it every time, and Crossan gets mad. No, it is real. It's just not literal. And, and, um, and so when, when I get flack from Christians saying, Doug, you just, you're focusing too much on the psychological, I can play your own words back at you. Guys like in the Q&A section, guys like uh, Michael Lacona, uh, many text messages in Facebook where basically you can just see the, this oozing of need for hope, meaning, and purpose um, as the real driver, I think, um, of what causes these different horizons, as Lycona said uh, in the intro statement. Any last thoughts? Yeah, basically, I think uh, Lacona wants uh, to get an eternal life. So he convinced himself that he lives in a magical world where resurrections happen and miracles happen and stuff like that to make the resurrection of Jesus less uh, fantastical by comparison. Well, I just, I, th I mean, I agree with you there, but I think that Lycona has never really developed the type of skepticism toward claims about the world that is required to separate, uh, you know, fact from fiction. And I think that that maybe owes to um, him never being 
never having been through a transition period in his life where he has found out how wrong he was about something that he thought was so true. Um, and I, th I find that oftentimes people need to go through this kind of transition. They need to believe in book Bigfoot and then realize that their reasons for believing in Bigfoot were terrible. They need to believe in ancient aliens and then realize how easy it was for them to be wrong about ancient aliens. And when he tells these stories about people in his life that he trusts where, you know, there is a, um, you know, an apparition of somebody who's just died or something that occur occurs at a seance or something like that. It just shows me how, um, how little he has uh, practiced uh, his investigation of into skepticism and critical thinking. And I think that it's not helping his historical scholarship. You see what I did there, Cam? That was almost brought a tear to my eye. Thanks everyone for hanging out. I know it was a little intense, historically speaking. And uh, I'll turn off the music for you two in the pier here so you're not going crazy. Okay, this is the post-show banter, so assume they can't hear you and say what you want to say. Oh, you're, uh, hang on, let me unmute you here. I enjoyed that debate, actually, between Cross and very interesting to me. My second most favorite debate I've seen. The first one was about whether uh, Sauron had a physical form in the third age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're e equally, um, equally fictitious. <laughs> uh, Doc, what, what did you think uh, uh, about the, the conversation we were having? Uh, it's obviously difficult for me to to, 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 to kind of evaluate it uh, while being a participant. You're asking my opinion how it went? Yeah, yeah. I'm never going to have you back on again. Thanks for uh, joining <laughs> us, everybody, in the live stream chat. It was, uh, it was good to see you all here. Uh, I think we were getting 70. And uh, if there was any donations, thank you for that. I didn't see any, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm not bitter. <laughs> No Applebee's today, kids. Massive amounts of money, okay. <laughs>